To be alone forty-three days would seem a long time. But in reality, even here, winged moments flew lightly by, and instead of my hauling in for Nukahiva, which I could have made as well as not, I kept on for Samoa, where I wished to make my next landing. This occupied twenty-nine days more, making seventy-two days in all. I was not distressed in any way during that time. There was no end of companionship. The very coral reefs kept me company, or gave me no time to feel lonely, which is the same thing, and there were many of them now in my course to Samoa. First among the incidents of the voyage from Juan Fernandez to Samoa, which were not many, was a narrow escape from collision with a great whale that was absent-mindedly playing the ocean at night while I was below. The noise from his startled snort and the commotion he made in the sea as he turned to clear my vessel brought me on deck in time to catch a wetting from the water he threw up with his flukes. The monster was apparently frightened. He headed quickly for the east. I kept on going west. Soon after, another whale passed, evidently a companion following in its wake. I saw no more on this part of the voyage, nor did I wish to. Hungry sharks came about the vessel often when she neared islands or coral reefs. I own to a satisfaction in shooting them as one would a tiger. Sharks, after all, are the tigers of the sea. Nothing is more dreadful to the mind of a sailor, I think, than a possible encounter with a hungry shark. A number of birds were always about. Occasionally, one poised on the mast to look the spray over wondering perhaps at her odd wings, for she now wore her fuego mainsail, which, like Joseph's coat, was made of many pieces. Ships are less common on the southern seas than formerly. I saw not one in the many days crossing the Pacific. My diet on these long passages usually consisted of potatoes and salt cod and biscuits, which I made two or three times a week. I had always plenty of coffee, tea, sugar and flour. I carried usually a good supply of potatoes, but before reaching Samoa I had a mishap which left me destitute of this highly prized sailor's luxury. Through meeting at Juan Fernandez, the Yankee Portuguese named Manuel Carrotha, who nearly traded me out of my boots, I ran out of potatoes in mid-ocean and was wretched thereafter. I prided myself on being something of a trader, but this Portuguese from the Azores by way of New Bedford, who gave me new potatoes for the older ones I had got from the Columbia, a bushel or more of the best, left me no ground for boasting. He wanted mine, he said, for changey the seed. When I got to sea, I found that his tubers were rank and unedible, and full of fine yellow streaks of repulsive appearance. I tied the sack up, and returned to the few left of my old stock, thinking that maybe when I got right hungry, the island potatoes would improve in flavour. Three weeks later, I opened the bag again, and out flew millions of winged insects. Manuel's potatoes had all turned to moths. I tied them up quickly and threw all into the sea. Manuel had a large crop of potatoes on hand, and as a hint to whalemen, who are always eager to buy vegetables, he wished me to report whales off the island of Juan Fernandez, which I have already done, and big ones at that, but they were a long way off. Taking things by and large, as sailors say, 
I got on fairly well in the matter of provisions, even on the long voyage across the Pacific. I found always some small stores to help the fare of luxuries. What I lacked of fresh meat was made up in fresh fish, at least while in the trade winds, where flying fish crossing on the wing at night would hit the sails and fall on deck, sometimes two or three of them, sometimes a dozen. Every morning, except when the moon was large, I got a bountiful supply by merely picking them up from the lee scuppers. All tinned meat went begging. On the 16th of July, after considerable care and some skill and hard work, the spray cast anchor at Apia in the kingdom of Samoa about noon. My vessel being moored, I spread an awning, and instead of going at once on shore, I sat under it till late in the evening, listening with delight to the musical voices of the Samoan men and women. A canoe coming down the harbour, with three young women in it, rested her paddles abreast the sloop. One of the fair crew, hailing with a naive salutation, Talofa Lee, love to you, chief, asked, Schoon come Malike? Love to you, I answered, and said yes. You man come lone? Again I answered yes. I don't believe that. You had other mans, and you ate them. At this sally, the others laughed. What for you come long way, they asked. To hear you ladies sing, I replied. O oh, Talofa Lee, they all cried, and sang on. Their voices filled the air with music that rolled across to the grove of tall palms on the other side of the harbour and back. Soon after this, six young men came down in the United States Consul General's boat, singing in parts and beating time with their oars. In my interview with them, I came off better than with the damsels in the canoe. They bore an invitation from General Churchill for me to come and dine at the consulate. There was a lady's hand in things about the consulate at Samoa, Mrs. Churchill picked the crew for the general's boat and saw to it that they wore a smart uniform and that they could sing the Samoan boat song, which in the first week Mrs. Churchill herself could sing like a native girl. Next morning, bright and early, Mrs. Robert Louis Stevenson came to the spray and invited me to Vilema the following day. I was, of course, thrilled when I found myself, after so many days of adventure, face to face with this bright woman, so lately the companion of the author who had delighted me on the voyage. The kindly eyes that looked me through and through sparkled when we compared notes of adventure. I marvelled at some of her experiences and escapes. She told me that along with her husband she had voyaged in all manner of rickety craft among the islands of the Pacific, reflectively adding, our tastes were similar. Following the subject of voyages, she gave me the four beautiful volumes of sailing directories for the Mediterranean, writing on the fly-leaf of the first to Captain Slocum. These volumes have been read and re-read many times by my husband, and I am very sure that he would be pleased that they should be passed on to the sort of seafaring man that he liked above all others. Fanny van de Grift Stevenson Mrs. Stevenson also gave me a great directory of the Indian Ocean. It was not without a feeling of reverential awe that I received the books, so nearly direct from the hand of Tusitala, who sleeps in the forest. O oh, Lele, the spray will cherish your gift. The novelist's stepson, Mr. Lloyd Osborne, 
walked through the Vilema mansion with me and bade me write my letters at the old desk. I thought it would be presumptuous to do that. It was sufficient for me to enter the hall on the floor of which the writer of tales, according to the Samoan custom, was wont to sit. Coming through the main street of Appia one day with my hosts, all bound for the spray, Mrs. Stevenson on horseback, I walking by her side, and Mr. and Mrs. Osborne close in our wake on bicycles. At a sudden turn in the road, we found ourselves mixed with a remarkable native procession, with a somewhat primitive band of music in front of us, while behind was a festival or a funeral, we could not tell which. Several of the stoutest men carried bales and bundles on poles. Some were evidently bales of tapper cloth. The burden of one set of poles, heavier than the rest, however, was not so easily made out. My curiosity was whetted to know whether it was a roast pig or something of a gruesome nature, and I inquired about it. I don't know, said Mrs. Stevenson, whether this is a wedding or a funeral. Whatever it is, though, Captain, our place seems to be at the head of it. The spray being in the stream, we boarded her from the beach abreast in the little razored Gloucester dory, which had been painted a smart green. Our combined weight loaded it gunwale to the water, and I was obliged to steer with great care to avoid swamping. The adventure pleased Mrs. Stevenson greatly, and as we paddled along she sang they went to sea in a pea-green boat. I could understand her saying of her husband and herself. Our tastes were similar. As I sailed farther from the centre of civilization, I heard less and less of what would and what would not pay. Mrs. Stevenson, in speaking of my voyage, did not once ask me what I would make out of it. When I came to a Samoan village, the chief did not ask the price of gin, or say, how much will you pay for roast pig? But dollar, dollar, said he, white man know only dollar. Never mind dollar, the tapo has prepared ava, let us drink and rejoice. The tapo is the virgin hostess of the village. In this instance it was Taloa, daughter of the chief. Our taro is good, let us eat. On the tree there is fruit. Let the day go by. Why should we mourn over that? There are millions of days coming. The breadfruit is yellow in the sun, and from the cloth tree is Taloa's gown. Our house, which is good, cost but the labour of building it, and there is no lock on the door. While the days go thus in the southern islands, we at the north are struggling for the bare necessities of life. For food, the islanders have only to put out their hand and take what nature has provided for them. If they plant a banana tree, their only care afterward is to see that too many trees do not grow. They have great reason to love their country and to fear the white man's yoke. For once harnessed to the plough, their life would no longer be a poem. The chief of the village of Kaini, who was a tall and dignified Tonga man, could be approached only through an interpreter and talking man. It was perfectly natural for him to inquire the object of my visit, and I was sincere when I told him that my reason for casting anchor in Samoa was to see their fine men and fine women too. After a considerable pause, the chief said, The captain has come a long way to see so little. But, he added, the tapo must sit nearer the captain. Yak, said Teloa, who had so nearly learned to say yes in English, and suiting the action to the word, 
she hitched a peg nearer, all hands sitting in a circle upon mats. I was no less taken with the chief's eloquence than delighted with the simplicity of all he said. About him there was nothing pompous. He might have been taken for a great scholar or statesman, the least assuming of the men I met on the voyage. As for Toloa, a sort of queen of the May, and the other Tapo girls, well, it is wise to learn as soon as possible the manners and customs of these hospitable people, and meanwhile not to mistake for over-familiarity that which is intended as honour to a guest. I was fortunate in my travels in the islands, and saw nothing to shake one's faith in native virtue. To the unconventional mind, the punctilious etiquette of Samoa is perhaps a little painful. For instance, I found that in partaking of Ava, the social bowl, I was supposed to toss a little of the beverage over my shoulder, or pretend to do so, and say, let the gods drink, and then drink it all myself. And the dish, invariably a coconut shell, being empty, I might not pass it politely as we would do, but politely throw it twirling across the mats at the tapo. My most grievous mistake while at the islands was made on a nag, which, inspired by a bit of good road, must needs break into a smart trot through a village. I was instantly hailed by the chief's deputy, who in an angry voice brought me to a halt. Perceiving that I was in trouble, I made signs for pardon, the safest thing to do, though I did not know what offence I had committed. My interpreter coming up, however, put me right, but not until a long palaver had ensued. The deputy's hail, liberally translated, was, Ahoy there on the frantic steed! Know you not that it is against the law to ride thus through the village of our fathers? I made what apologies I could, and offered to dismount, and like my servant, lead my nag by the bridle. This, the interpreter told me, would also be a grievous wrong, and so I again begged for pardon. I was summoned to appear before a chief, but my interpreter, being a wit as well as a bit of a rogue, explained that I was myself something of a chief, and should not be detained, being on a most important mission. In my own behalf, I could only say that I was a stranger, but, pleading all this, I knew I still deserved to be roasted, at which the chief showed a fine row of teeth, and seemed pleased, but allowed me to pass on. The chief of the Tongas and his family at Kaini, returning my visit, brought presents of tapa cloth and fruits. Taloa the princess brought a bottle of coconut oil for my hair, which another man might have regarded as coming late. It was impossible to entertain on the spray after the royal manner in which I had been received by the chief. His fare had included all that the land could afford, fruits, fowls, fishes, and flesh, a hog having been roasted whole. I set before them boiled salt pork and salt beef, with which I was well supplied, and in the evening took them all to a new amusement in the town, a rocking-horse merry-go-round, which they called a kiki, meaning theatre. And in a spirit of justice, they pulled off the horses' tails. For the proprietors of the show, two hard-fisted countrymen of mine, I grieve to say, unceremoniously hustled them off for a new set, almost at the first spin. I was not a little proud of my Tonga friends. The chief, finest of them all, carried a portentous club. As for the theatre, through the greed of the proprietors, it was becoming unpopular, and the representatives of the three great powers, 
in want of laws which they could enforce, adopted a vigorous foreign policy, taxing it 25% on the gate money. This was considered a great stroke of legislative reform. It was the fashion of the native visitors to the spray to come over the bows, where they could reach the headgear and climb aboard with ease, and on going ashore to jump off the stern and swim away. Nothing could have been more delightfully simple. The modest natives wore lava-lava bathing dresses, a native cloth from the bark of the mulberry tree, and they did no harm to the spray. In Summerland Samoa, their coming and going was only a merry everyday scene. One day, the head teachers of Papauta College, Miss Schultz and Miss Moore, came on board with their 97 young women students. They were all dressed in white and each wore a red rose and of course came in boats or canoes in the cold climate style. A merrier bevy of girls it would be difficult to find. As soon as they got on deck, by request of one of the teachers, they sang The Watch on the Rhine, which I had never heard before. And now, said they all, let up anchor and away but I had no inclination to sail from Samoa so soon. On leaving the spray, these accomplished young women each seized a palm branch or paddle or whatever else would serve the purpose, and literally paddled her own canoe. Each could have swum as readily, and would have done so, I dare say, had it not been for the holiday muslin. It was not uncommon at Appia to see a young woman swimming alongside a small canoe with a passenger for the spray. Mr. Trude, an old Eton boy, came in this manner to see me, and he exclaimed, Was ever king ferried in such state? Then, suiting his action to the sentiment, he gave the damsel pieces of silver till the natives watching on shore yelled with envy. My own canoe, a small dugout, one day when it rolled over with me, was seized by a party of fair bathers, and before I could get my breath almost, was towed around and around the spray, while I sat in the bottom of it, wondering what they would do next. But in this case there were six of them, three on a side, and I could not help myself. One of the sprites, I remember, was a young English lady who made more sport of it than any of the others.